we are looking, as we're moving through Mark, we've been looking at these passages in chapter 13 that I told you when we started, it's, it, the whole thing is called the Olivet Discourse, or the, some people call it the Little Apocalypse. Um, we talked about why when we began looking at this a few weeks ago. And today we move into the area that more specifically speaks to the, uh, the coming of Jesus, the, the return of Jesus. That, and we're going to show you, uh, I've used the word proleptic with you before in terms of prophecy, that you've got to cultivate a proleptic approach to prophecy. That is, we need to kill this. Concerning the, that, that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Help us, Lord, to be found in the very exact posture that Jesus uh, admonishes his disciples as he closes out this section. Be on guard, be awake, be alert. Lord, help us to be found as such a people as we anticipate and hope to be the soon coming of our Savior. Thank you. Please be seated. I was telling the folks at prayer meeting Wednesday night that I saw a uh, church sign recently. It said, Jesus is coming soon, hopefully before the election. In the first portions of this Olivet Discourse, Jesus is responding to a request from four of his disciples, remember? Peter, James, John, and Andrew, who asked them after they had, after they had uh, talked about how wonderful the temple was, and Jesus said, they didn't understand that. He said, tell us, how can we know that? So he's responding to that in these verses. And we've looked at these previous verses over the last several weeks. Prophesied a number of signs that they should watch for in order to know when the destruction of the temple was imminent. No 
two stones will be standing upon this temple. When's that going to happen? How's it going to happen? And so he's, he is speaking. Here's what I want you to begin to think holistically. He is speaking about the near, the near immediate destruction of the temple, which is a sign of the end of Judaism and that the, the focus of worshiping God shifts from a physical building, the temple, to what will be taught the spiritual temple because the body of Christ going to be offered for the people of God. And so he uses this analogy. So that's the, the, the near immediate destruction of the temple, the long-term look at the coming of the Lord, which will be obviously a day of rejoicing and rescue for us. It's going to be a great day of judgment. And I want you to keep that in mind. Because the language he uses here, the destruction of the temple was indeed the judgment of God upon the people of God. And there will be a great judgment coming in the days to come. There's tension here, and if you read people on this, you're going to find commentators are going to fall out in one of two camps, typically. I'm, I, I don't think either one is adequate, but one of them is that it, it's only talking about the literal destruction of the temple in 70 AD, because that's all he has in mind. Another group says, no, no, it's, it's all figurative, and it anticipates the end of the age the return of Christ, the consummation of the age. I think it's speaking to both. I hope you're able to show you that as we move through the passage today. Because when you put together things like Jesus talking about coming in the clouds, and then saying that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, you've got a challenge there. Coming in the clouds, that's the end. This generation, the generation of speaking to them, we're going to try to move through this in a responsible way. I want you to see in this text today, three three things to consider. First of all, the powerful and glorious display of the Son of Man. Verses 24 to 25. Secondly, the importance of discerning the times. Verses 28 to 31. And then third, the exhortation to engage vigilance. Engage vigilance. First, let's look at this powerful and glorious display of the Son of Man. He says, Verse 24, but in those days, after that tribulation, we looked at the the passage that talked about this this tribulation coming, that you uh, pray that it won't be in winter, pray that you you will not be pregnant. It's going to be a fierce time. It's 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 expansive. It covers, it's a comprehensive worldwide. And I said to you at the time, we dare not teach as the church in the West that somehow we're going to get rescued from all of this before it gets really bad because In the 20th century, and it hasn't let up in the 21st, more people were martyred for the cause of Christ in the 20th century than the total combined previous 19. It's already really bad for many people in in France. Joshua read to you about Somalia. 200, less than 200 believers in an entire country. 100 like that. Killed in the name of Allah. What we need to do is prepare for that. And teach our children and our grandchildren to get ready for that. I, I read every week, I, and I, I, I could probably wear you out just reading things that are happening now since, since I met with you the last time and uh, was preaching on this. Massachusetts has a law. It's going to require churches to have their public gatherings let people come and use the facilities according to the gender with which they identify. The Civil Rights Commission, a federal group, has said, is on record, it's been jointly put together by Congress in 1957, it has said that it cannot imagine a scenario where a civil rights issue and a uh, uh, First Amendment issue, religious liberty, clash in the First Amendment room. So I'm not speaking of the Doomsday Clock, but we, we need each other to push and we need more disciples. But we better get ready. We better be wise and discerning. So this, this powerful and glorious display of the Son of Man after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. This is this this, this cosmic language here that is used. The stars will be falling from heaven. The 
powers in the heavens will be shaken. And they will see the Son of Man. Son of Man was Jesus' favorite designation of himself. Taken from the, from the pages of Daniel's prophecy. Do you see the Son of Man coming? How he liked to identify himself. As the Son of God, he came to identify with us as men and women and boys and girls. And so this designation, the Son of Man, anticipates him in Daniel. And he embraced it as his favorite title. They'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now I want you to, to consider this cosmic language and just show you one passage in Isaiah. Pardon me. First of all, I want you to know that, that it does remind us of 1 Thessalonians that we read in chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. We just read it together earlier. Let's look at it again briefly. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we always be with the Lord. This, this great victory that's coming for the people of God who persevere. But there's also a passage in Isaiah that uses the, the language Chapter 13, verses 6 to 10. It's speaking about the coming judgment upon, upon Babylon. Notice the similarity. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble. Every human heart will numb. They'll be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath, fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. Notice, for the stars of the heavens and their constellation will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising. The moon will not shed its light. Jesus uses this kind of imagery to teach about judgment and to for him to say what he said to these Jews who were familiar with their Jewish heritage and familiar with God's work among the people of God and familiar with the prophets, they heard this as Jesus saying, judgment is coming. Now, he's told them recently that he's going to die and be handed over, put to death, rise again. And, and I'm quite sure when you see their responses, and we looked at this, we looked at this on Sunday evening because we're studying following Jesus day by day, that it, it tore them up. They did not hear victory in that. They heard defeat in that. And so what he's telling them here is that judgment is coming. But in the midst of judgment will be the victorious Son of Man. The question is asked, tell us a sign from this temple to be destroyed. He's answering that question. Divine judgment is coming. There's an interesting passage in the writings of Josephus. We told you about Josephus. He was a Jewish historian commenting on things that were experienced leading up to the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. Listen to this. He said there were reports of, of some uh, astronomical occurrences that were phenomenal. Some reported that a comet screamed across the sky. And they regarded that comet as, as a sign of coming judgment. But here's Josephus' report. A few days after that feast, on the one and twentieth day of the month of Artemisius, a certain prodigious and in incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those that saw it and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sun setting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding the city. Moreover, at the feast which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that, they heard a sound as of a great multitude saying, Let us remove hence. This is Josephus now, reporting what was told had occurred leading up to, as a prelude to,
to to the structure of the temple in 70 A.D. His testimony is that multitudes of people saw chariots and armed soldiers moving around the cloud. Now, if you're familiar with with that imagery, your your mind goes to Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm just going to cite this quickly for you. When he was surrounded by the Syrian army, the king of Syria had sent an army. We've actually studied it through that at one time to capture Elisha. And his servants went out and saw horses, chariots, and troops, and he panicked. He came back and fled with Elijah. What are we going to do? Remember Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. God answered that prayer. Elisha's servant saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now in this particular instance, it was a a powerful picture of God's protection of the prophet. But the imagery that Josephus mentions is a powerful picture of God's pending judgment upon the people. challenge in moving to a passage like this is when you when you look and say, okay, we want to take a look at the nearly immediate fulfillment of this in A.D. 70, is the way that things were asked in Matthew 24. As Matthew 24 records the question that the disciples asked when they said, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so it seems that they, they were anticipating the final consummation when they asked that. And of course, what we then understand when we we unpack biblical passages is that this idea of an end of an age can speak of the end of time or it can speak of the end of an era. Jesus said in Luke 21, 24 that Jerusalem would be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That, That is the age of the Gentiles. Paul speaks of the fullness of the Gentiles in Romans 11, 25. Take a collective look. What will be the sign that, that, this, that this era is coming to an end? Because the, his disciples understood that if the temple were to be destroyed, then worship of the one true God as they had known it would diminish. It's not too far to go. Remember when they were in captivity? wrote in captivity, we hung our harps on the willows. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Their mindset was we were taken from our land, from the place where we gathered to worship God. How can we worship God if we don't have a place? That was the way they thought. And so there is this, there is this focus, a near immediate focus, on the destruction of the temple that will signal the end of an era. I said earlier, when, when the shift would go from worshiping God in a place Remember Jesus' conversation with the woman of Samaria at the well of Sychar in John chapter 6. Sir, you, you, seem to, you seem to know some things. So tell us, if we say we worship on this mount and others say on this mount. Where's the right place to worship? And Jesus told her that the time is coming when it will not be a, a matter of a place for us. But worshiping God will be a matter of spirit and according to truth spiritual worship of God. And so you have this this tension, I think, that takes us through what Jesus is trying to say. And we have we look at the immediate, nearly immediate, 70 AD destruction and the long term ultimate judgment of God. will be such that it will be like planets melting in intensity. Not not of the persecution of the church. That's that's here and that's going to continue. But the intensity of God's judgment upon those who have taken their place as his enemies to harm his people. It says further that he will he will send his angels to gather his elect from all over the world. Interesting here that from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Comprehensive, universal. How 
how we'd understand that. Well, obviously, the long look is clear. An angelic messenger, the angelic host will come and will gather up the elect when the, uh, when the time has come. When the fig tree, you know, I'll look at the image here in a minute. When the fig tree has ripened. When it's time, as one writer said years ago, when it's time for God to blow history out like a candle and roll it up like a scroll, and he will come and vindicate his own. But I want to remind you that the word translated message, angel is really not translated. It's just transliterated. In, in the New Testament Greek, it's angelos. And that just comes to us as angel. Because it means messenger. And the near immediate look at this could well mean that he will send his gospel messenger to preach the gospel as the means of gathering his chosen ones from all over the earth. And he will continue doing that. But the destruction of the temple will not stop that. But the destruction of the temple will, will fan the flame of that. As we know that it did historically. So I want you to see secondly now the importance of discerning the time. There's this, there's this glorious and powerful coming of the Son of Man. They've just been told Jesus is going to be killed. But he wants them to know it's not defeat. It's the path through which victory will be accomplished. He will come in the clouds in power. And he will come and judgment will come. And so when they would see the destruction of the temple, they should not lose heart and think all of this has been for nothing. It's something he told them was going to happen. And that's one of those signs that should encourage them that, that the victory, the obvious victory is coming. Second thing is the importance of discerning the time. Look at verses 28 to 31. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches branch becomes tender and puts out leaves, you know the summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gate. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This imagery of the fig tree, the Olivet, Mount, the Mount of Olives, was uh, also a place proliferated with fig trees. They, they were able to see what he was talking about, the imagery he was talking about, right in front of them. But there's an indication that when the fig tree, uh, as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, that corresponds to a season of the year. And he says, so it is. When, when you see events unfolding, much like the fig tree becoming tender, then you know this is the season that is coming. He is near. He is near. Even at the gate. And again, this imagery, this idea of being at the gate, they still have the temple in their mind right now. But he has come, and they, what they're hearing him say is, is that while the temple may be destroyed by a foreign enemy, which is what they would see, that it is his judgment. Remember, we're in the last week, and, and we showed you how, uh, in that, in that, after the triumphal entry, how he ramps it up. He, Jesus presses the issue. Until that point, he has sort of been rebuffing them. He's, they've come and asked questions to trick him, and he, he has taken the questions and turned them on their head and asked them questions, and they, they dare not answer him. He said, well, I'm not going to answer your questions if you won't answer mine. But it moves beyond that in Passion Week, where he then calls them out. His language has become very, uh, very pointed, very accusatory of the religious establishment. But he wants them to understand that when, when you see these things happening, it means that he is at the gate to judge. He's the one who is behind bringing the temple down so that there be no two stones in the middle. How can that be, you ask? Well, the Lord used Nebuchadnezzar, head of the Babylonians, to take his people captive. And he calls him in the course of that, my king, Nebuchadnezzar, who does that. He takes a foreign king and uses him to punish his people in captivity and then punishes Nebuchadnezzar for the severity with which he punished the people of God. That's our God. That's our God. He has sway, sovereign sway over everything. And he will take the 
Roman and use them to bring the temple down and that it would be the judgment of his son bringing an end to Judaism as the locus and the focus of, of the worship of the one true God. So he goes on to say, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, again, that seems pretty plain that, that what he's saying is the, the generation in which you live will still be living when this, these powerful things happen surrounding the temple's destruction. Fair enough. But again, generation can be used not only of a, of a fixed time frame of people, but it can be used of a type of people. And he could well be saying, I mean, commentators will differ on this, whether he's saying that, that a culture of unbelief will continue on and these things will come to pass. There'll still be unbelief. Other writers say, maybe perhaps he's saying that there will still be followers of Jesus Christ. And it seems to me that in terms of the victorious tone that he's giving here, that that's the proper understanding. Here's your proleptic look. You will still be alive when this happens in Israel. But when it comes to the end of the age, the longer look, there will still be a people of God. There's always been a remnant. There always will be. So that they should not lose heart when they begin to be persecuted intentionally and think that, that Christianity is going to be exterminated. No, just the opposite is true. When Christianity is persecuted, it is like throwing gasoline on a fire. It always, it always fans the flames. It always fans and spreads like wildfire. And he wants them to understand that. The persecution does not mean something's gone wrong with the harvest. It doesn't mean something has gone wrong with the mission. It means that the mission is progressing and persecution will become a means to advance the mission more rapidly. And by the way, brothers and sisters, that is true worldwide. The church is growing fastest in the world today. And persecution is the most intense. We're going to get to North Korea, which will be number one in just a few weeks as we're climbing the, the top 50 hot spots, most difficult places on the planet. And North Korea is number one. I'm, I'm not giving away anything. It's been number one every year that we've done this. Did you know that the North Korean, the lunatic leader of the North Korea, fears the Christians? They fear them. Because you can't threaten them. They die for their cause. I mean, it's, it's horrible, horrendous how they die. But you can't threaten them. You can't shut them up. Any more than the authorities could shut up the Peter and John when they, when they beat them and said, don't speak of this name anymore. Yes, the most difficult place on the planet to be a follower of Jesus Christ is one of the hottest places where the gospel is going. Same is true in Iran. We've already come through Iran in, in the past. There are more Muslims coming to faith in Christ in Iran today than at any time in its history. Why? Because they've let up? No, because they've intensified persecution. And so Jesus wants his followers to know that. And so he, he encourages them with this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And by saying that, he basically, he says essentially, my word is God's word. My word is God's word. How certainly can you take what I'm telling you? You can take it as surely as you take any prophecy that you have read to you and taught to you growing up from, from the, the Tanakh, the law of the, the prophets and, and the writers. Jesus equates his word is the living word of God. And so you see this, this movement here. Immediate, near immediate, you'll be alive. Ultimate, there will be followers all the way to the end. The flame will never be completely snuffed out. If you're a student of church history, you know that there have been times leading up to the Reformation when it was, it was difficult to find true believers, but they were always there. They were always there. Sometimes like a, like a stream running silently underground. The church has always been there. And the third thing I want you to see is that 
exhortation to engage vigilance. And this is really, this is really, I think, what he's pushing to in the discourse. He's given them some information, but really and truly what he wants to call them to and would call us to today is, is an engaged vigilance. Look at verses 32 to 37. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, you have, and I, any of us here have lived long enough, and some of these folks have gathered a following. And I don't know why, but they seem to, they seem to coax them into sitting on a mountaintop in Arkansas. I don't know what it is about mountains in Arkansas. They don't have to house much of them or something. But they seem to be willing to go there, and they will. And I'm talking. I figured out the day. I've, I've gone and done some mathematical calculations, he says, and I've, I've found the secrets in the Bible that tells us the exact day and time. Well, that's interesting. Jesus himself said he didn't know. Here's the lesson here, folks. If Jesus didn't know, then it's none of my business. And it's none of your business. And I think that we need to be careful. There are people who would get, a, get us caught up in trying to figure this out. I know people that read the Bible or read the newspaper, read the Bible, read the newspaper, read the Bible, read the newspaper, and think, I've found it. No, you got to read the Bible. And I suppose the newspaper, you need to check the news you get. You ought to read the Bible and understand it. figure out something so much as to prepare to know how we should live in these coming times. You see, I think there was a time in our nation, the history of our nation, when it was, it was fun to try to figure this out. Things have changed drastically in our nation. And now it's critical to understand what manner of men and women we must be in these days. He says, concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. How can that be? Well, I think I, I like what R.C. Sproul said. He said, Jesus' human nature was not omniscient, but his divine nature was not diminished. Fully divine, fully human, son of God. Surrendered his prerogative to deity, Philippians 2 says. Emptied himself, not of his deity, but his prerogative to deity. And so he said, I do nothing except what the Father tells me to do. I say nothing except what the Father tells me to say. And so he voluntarily put limitations upon himself, and the Father set this to himself. So says the Son of Man. So if that is true, then you and I don't need to know. Notice what else he says, what we do know. Be on guard. Keep awake. Let's see that in the mission statement. Be on guard. It's easy to get complacent. It's easy to get sleepy. In fact, I really believe in the scheme of God, in his plan for the advance of the gospel in the West, that he's had to come and wake up a sleeping church. We have been, as, as Keith Green sang, the church asleep in the light. He's waking us up. And if we said to one another, you need to be careful, you need to watch around your house for burglaries, we'd say, yeah, that's probably true. But if someone broke into your, the house next door, it would change the way you live. And that's where we are, folks. Be on guard. Keep awake word to a sleepy church. Isn't it ironic that not many hours after he says this, when he takes them into the garden to pray, what happens? They sleep. Will you not watch and pray with me? They sleep. So brothers and sisters, if the disciples who walked with Jesus three plus years couldn't stay awake in the Garden of Gethsemane. We had better be on guard. If we don't have Jesus to reach out and touch, if we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, then the danger for the church is out of sight, out of mind. I appreciated what Karen read earlier. I've said this for the 11 years I've been here. 
God will do business with his church when we begin to do business with him in prayer. Because prayer is the one reality that shows beyond any shadow of a doubt that we need God. I say that. You do not know when the time will come. And he gives us this image, this, this illustration. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. It's the doorkeeper's job. To be alert. To watch. Isaiah uses the imagery of, of, the people, of the preachers of God as watchmen on the wall, sounding the alarm. He to be awake. Therefore, stay awake. Friends, how many times did you use this verse? For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. Jesus asked the question, a very penetrating question, of course, when when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? It's a challenge to the church. How will he find us doing If we really believe what we sang earlier, Jesus is coming soon. I'm not going to give you a day or time because I don't know it. It's none of my business. I'm going to tell you this much I know. It's closer today than it was yesterday. And the signs are all around us. And I wonder sometimes, what is it going to take to wake up the church? What's it going to take to stop us in our tracks? so that we begin to do business with God on God's terms of doing business with Him. What's it going to take? Lest He come suddenly and find you asleep and just... doesn't even go into what consequences there would be. He simply just puts that out there to grip them. And oh, how they had to be pounded. And a few hours later, they could not watch and pray. Brothers and sisters, I submit to you that the church in the West still has trouble watching and praying. 9-11-2001 sort of jolted us a little bit. Church houses began to be filled with people, gatherings at prayer times at unusual times. We got over it. We got over it. We yawned and went on back to business as usual. It makes you wonder, what is coming down the pike for us that we will not? said finally, what I say to you, I say to all. Stay awake. Stay awake. Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, O sleeper. Christ will give you light. He'll shine on you. Oh, we've got to wake up, brothers and sisters. We're going back to fall asleep. There's no time to yawn. There's no time to slumber, to fold your hands. America, the United States of America, is one of the largest mission fields on the face of the earth today. And the fastest growing religious expressions in this country are not evangelical Christianity. They're Mormonism, Islam. Wake up, brothers and sisters. Don't fall asleep. Be ready. Be ready. When I was in seminary, I had the privilege of studying under a professor named Dr. Thomas Sproul, who who died after I left that school. I think he died of cancer. He was taking us through a study, an exegetical study of 1 Thessalonians. He got to him and said, I want to give you a three-point bedrock eschatology. You know the word eschatology? It's a, it's a fancy term, uh, ology of, for the study of eschaton. And eschaton means the last thing. Okay? One of the professors said, you know, it's called the doctrine of the last things for a reason. You don't study it first. It's called the doctrine of Scripture. It's called the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of marriage, the doctrine of sin. He said, I want to give you a three-point eschatology. I want to give this to you today. 
doesn't matter whether you call out the short free meal or the sensational free meal, the I meal, the post meal. Here it is. I got this for six cents. And it comes right out of the text here. First of all, the certainty of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The destruction of the temple has already occurred. It was the near immediate fulfillment of what he was talking about. We live in the centuries since then, drawing ever nearer to the ultimate fulfillment. This will be judgment upon, upon religion, whether it's false religion, the false religion of Islam, or Buddhism, or Judaism, or the false religion of the shell called Christianity that worships God with its lips but does not worship him with its heart. Judgment coming. Judgment coming upon the enemies of God. The certainty of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's absolute. He is coming again. That's what we're saying. The scripture teaches us. We better believe it. Secondly, the uncertainty of the time of his coming. The uncertainty of the time of his coming. Don't waste your time. In fact, if you're watching TV and one of these TV preachers says that he knows, use your remote and move on. Don't waste your time. He's about the last one. He won't even get this right as a blind hog. You know, they say a blind hog in the congregation every now and then. No, he won't even get it right now. It's kept to the Father. No one will stumble upon it. The uncertainty of the time. Third, this is, this is where Jesus presses this passage. The absolute necessity of being found watching and waiting for his return. Isn't it? Watching means focused on his glory and his mission. His glory. Whatever you do, eating, drinking, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, do all to the glory of God. His mission. His mission is for disciples to become disciple makers who make disciple makers. It's really that, that keyed in. He didn't give us another mission. And you've heard it pitched up different ways. I had a friend of mine who said that we are really, we're all worshipers. We're all members of the celestial choir here on earth for the time being. And we're called to go out and enlist other choir members. Well, that's true. But we need to teach them to sing and to enlist other choir members. It's disciple makers who make disciple makers. That is the Great Commission. As we've called it here, it's the, it's the commandment hiding in plain sight at the end of Matthew 28. Watching. Waiting. Waiting is not sitting back passively twiddling our thumbs. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, Isaiah says in Isaiah 4. It is those who serve the Lord, those who, who engage life for Him, those who look for opportunities to bless others in the name of the, of the blessed God, those who wait upon the Lord, watching and waiting. And I think I can promise you this. The church that commits to be awake and not sleep, the church that commits to, to watch and focus upon the seasons and the times to anticipate how we live as we await the return of our Lord and those who wait upon him, who serve him, that's a church that will catch fire with intercessory prayer. That's a church that will catch fire so that the neighborhoods we live in will burn for the glory of God. I told you about the preacher I heard one time who said, if Christians, if Christians would just catch on fire, the world would gather around just to watch them burn. That's a church that God will come into the midst of mightily. We don't need better circumstances. We need hearts more committed to the focus that Jesus gives here because he is coming back. How do I know that? He destroyed the temple in 70 A.D. And many other things have happened in the history of the world since then. And all of them point to the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you be ready? Will you be watching and waiting as a follower of Jesus Christ? There are some here today who have not trusted Jesus Christ. You've not committed your life to him. You've not said yes to him. Yes, Lord, I am yours and I want you to be mine. You've not done that. You're not ready. You are not ready. And you do not want to be found unprepared when it comes. It's my 
prayer is that today you would confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. For his glory and the salvation of your soul and the enabling of the transformation that comes to you as a follower of Jesus Christ to begin to be made ready for his return. Let's pray with you. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name and we thank you for this passage. It's, uh, we confess, it's, uh, our minds can't wrap around it completely, but we're thankful that your word wraps around us and teaches us and convinces us and changes us. And Lord, I guess that's my prayer. I want us to be changed. I want us to be changed. We see the storm clouds gather. And we're not fearful. We're not going to go hide in a bunker. The church, the persecuted church in the world does not do that. It, it runs to danger. It doesn't hide from it. Father, find us ready. Help us to be prepared to be your people. Salt and light in a, in a, in a decaying and, and ever darkening culture. Find us faithful, watching, waiting. And I pray for those here who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ. That today, the truth of a crucified and risen Savior, Jesus coming to do all of this, to live and die and rise again. That sinners would be saved and brought to him. I pray that that would grip the hearts of some here today. They would, for the first time in their life, confess him as Lord and Savior. And I, I even hold out, Lord, that some would confess him genuinely for the first time. He may have confessed him in the past, but it's just been a little cold. It's not been a heart change. I pray that today the soon coming king would come individually to sinners who would 